All right, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we're gonna be talking about building cloud-friendly applications. My name is Larry Garfield. Uh, you may know me online as Krell. If you want to make fun of me on Twitter during the session, that's where you do so, I highly encourage it. I'm the Director of Developer Experience at Platform SH, or a continuous deployment cloud hosting company. Um, we have a booth here if you wanna ask questions later. Anyone here a PHP developer? Nope, okay, then I, I, no one's gonna get the other two references, so I'll skip them. All right, so let's talk about clouds. Wrong clouds. No, uh, I, I mean cloud hosting, cloud, you know, the, the network clouds. As I mentioned, I work at Platform SH, which means uh, I've gotten to work with a lot of applications designed to run on servers, with there are a lot of different web applications, uh, some of which are very good, and some of which, um, if you can't see anything nice, don't see anything at all, so I won't mention them again. But we keep hearing that clouds are the next big thing. Clouds are taking over the world, cloud-based computing is where it's at. But what exactly are we talking about? What is a cloud? And how do we write software that works well with it? Well, there's really two questions here. What is cloud computing and what is the cloud? These are two different questions with two different answers. The easy one, the cloud, if you hear someone talk about putting stuff on the cloud, they mean someone else's hard drive. This is hosting, it's outsourcing, we've been doing this since the 90s. This is a marketing term, and you should understand it as a marketing term for someone else's hard drive. Not gonna get into this in too much detail. What I wanna talk about a bit more, however, is cloud computing. Cloud computing, is about abstracting away physical infrastructure. This often runs in the cloud, meaning someone else's hard drive, <clears throat> but it doesn't have to. You can certainly hire companies like Platform to manage your cloud computing environment, but you can run everything, you can run a cloud computing environment on your own hardware if you are so inclined. The idea here is that you wanna deal in logical systems, logical computer systems that are not aligned with physical pieces of hardware. You may have one server with 15 logical systems on it, or you may have 15 log physical systems with one logical system that spreads across all of them, or some combination of the two. Usually it's a few hundred logical systems that span across a few dozen physical boxes. But the idea here is that the logical system you are thinking about, when you think about a, a system where the server is disconnected from physical hardware. This lets you have disposable application design. You may have heard the idea before that your systems should be cattle, not pets. That's what we're talking about. <clears throat> you should be able to knock over and recreate a system without messing with hardware. Your application should be able to do the same thing. You want your application to be disposable. So how do we write software, how do we write applications that play well with that model, play well with this disposable application model? As I mentioned, I've worked with a lot of systems um, at the platform, and I wanna provide some guidelines based on things I've seen work well and things that have made my life difficult, so please don't do them. The first is split code from content. What do we mean by that? What is code? Code is provided by the developer. It has been carefully tested before going live, right? Right, good. It's going to live in version control, right? People are too quiet for that one. And at runtime, you want it to be read-only. Why? For security. At runtime, your code should be read-only because it makes it harder for an attacker to uh, take over. Content, on the other hand, is provided by users. <clears throat> it is frequently ad hoc, could be as simple as someone posting a blog comment or as complicated as someone filling in uh, a workflow form or whatever else they're doing, or data coming in through an API that uh, you're, you're serving. It's going to live either in a database of some kind, doesn't matter what kind, or in a file system, and it has to be writable. These are two very different things. They should be on different file systems. If you try to put both of these on the same file system, you will fail. It's just not gonna work, because you cannot have a single file system that is both read-only and writable at the same time. <coughs> So you wanna split this by directory. A given directory in your system should be either coming from 
source control and it's code and it's read only, or it is data and it is writable and that's the end of it. You could use something like Amazon S3 for this, doesn't matter where your writable file system is, it could be something local, uh, that's gonna vary with the host, but they need to be separate things. Remember, your application is disposable, but your data is not. If your data is disposable, you don't have an application, you have a test environment. Your, the flow you're going to have in your system looks something like this. You're going to have your development environment, your laptop or whatever you're doing, and you're gonna be pushing and pulling code into Git, or technically any version control system, but everyone uses Git these days. And periodically, you're going to pull data, or pull your, um, your code out of Git, go through some kind of build process, you know, compiling it, running less build, SAS build, what if, you know, installing NPM components, whatever you're doing. And that's gonna produce some kind of build artifact. It could be a container image, could just be files, whatever it is, and that's what you're going to launch in production. The data is already in production, and you're periodically gonna pull that back down. Code only goes this way, data only goes this way. So please don't confuse the two, and you don't really get an in-between option. You don't really have something that is code-ish and data-ish. That doesn't work. I've seen systems try to do it, it doesn't work. So save yourself time and try and not do that. So give yourself a clear separation between dev-provided and user-provided stuff. What about configuration? Is configuration code or is configuration content? Well, does it come from the developer or the user? Could be both, you know, could be either. Does it get into production, does, is its canonical source in Git or is its canonical source the database? Either of these is a valid answer. You're not doing it wrong for either of these, but know which one you're doing and commit to it. This is usually not an issue for a bespoke application, but for a, a distributed application, or, or to, um, an off-the-shelf application, a content management system especially, but any other system where it's designed to be configurable, you're designed to have buttons you can push to uh, change the configuration, this becomes extremely important. If you can push buttons in production to change your configuration, it is not code, and you can't then version control those changes or you can version control those changes and then the buttons in production don't work. Either one is fine, but please pick one. The most robust answer here I've seen is uh, Drupal 8's configuration management system. Who's worked with Drupal at all? I can barely see. A couple of people, okay. In Drupal 8, uh, con configuration is done through the UI and saved in the database, but it's designed to be exported to YAML files. And so you can push a button and export your entire site configuration to a directory full of YAML files, which you can then check into Git, push around as code, and then in production, import that into the site and you've up updated your configuration. This works. This works reasonably well. It is also incredibly over-engineered, and there are at least 14,000 edge cases, only 13,000 of which Drupal actually accounts for. And those other thousands are always the ones you're going to run into because you know, Murphy's Law. So you probably don't need something this elaborate. Fundamentally, just decide which it's gonna be. Is configuration user, con user configuration? Is that something that happens in the database only? Or is that code and happens in code only? Pick one. What happens at runtime stays at runtime. Excuse the Vegas reference. Your application is going to slot into an environment. That environment already has data available to it. Could be your primary database, it could be a search index, uploaded files, whatever it is. But your application exists separate from it and needs to be compatible with multiple environments. What do I mean by multiple environments? Dev stage prod, those are different environments. Your test environment, different environments. You have a multi-headed system, so you mul might have multiple instances of your application running. That's different environments. You and your application code should assume nothing about the environment itself. <clears throat> Instead, you need to have a dependency injected into your application at runtime. That includes database credentials, or anything, any kind of data store, not just your primary database, any API keys you have, 
any paths on disk, domain names, including the domain of your site. Remember, your production site and your staging site are not the same domain name, I hope. You do have a separate pr production from, stage, from testing, right? I, good. So your application code, the same code, needs to work in both situations. <clears throat> you can have paths that are relative to root, that's okay, or relative to your application root, but not on the whole uh, system, because that's gonna be different depending on where it's deployed. So how do you dependency inject it? The standard way that most people use are environment variables. Every language has a mechanism for this. I think it's all readable. Uh, usually some kind of env or get env routine <coughs> or function. Uh, you know, wh whatever language you're using is fine. This is how all of the environment-specific information gets into your application. You do not always control them, however, and you cannot necessarily choose what they're called because every host you're using, every different cloud platform, is gonna have a different naming convention. There is currently no standard naming convention for how to provide things like API keys, things like uh, your database credentials, things like the path that your application is at on disk, stuff like that. And therefore, you're going to need glue code. Your application needs to have a place to put glue code. Whatever it is, it's going to be very application specific and very host specific, and that's okay. Just make sure you have a place to do that. Here's an example, uh, you can sort of read this. Um, for Symfony 3 at Platform SH, this is the glue code, roughly, that we have people use. It's just copy and paste, they don't need to pay much attention to it. We provide database credentials and other stuff like that in an environment variable named platform relationships. So you pull it out on the environment, it's an encoded blob, so you just JSON decode that, and then pull out values and stick it into the uh, Symfony's dependency injection container. Cool. Fairly boring, it should be. We've also now released uh, configuration libraries for five different languages uh, to make this a little bit easier. So we have one for PHP. If Express is your jam, who, any node people in the room? Okay. So in this case, you have an NPM package you install that just wraps get env calls, basically, and then you call the credentials uh, method on it and stick that into setting up your connection. And now, you never know what the database credentials are. They could, we could change them on a moment's notice, and it's okay, because you're just gonna pick up whatever we provide in that environment variable. This is more portable, this is more secure. If you're in Go, Gophers in the room? Few people? <clears throat> then we have essentially the same thing. We have a, uh, a library you'd, that you can download, and then read values out of that. It just gives you Go structs pre-populated with the structure of our uh, environment variables. And then just grab that, read the port that you should start your application on, and it'll run listening on that port. If we ever change that port, because we need to reconfigure our networking, this will keep working, you don't notice the difference. This is a good thing. Different hosts are gonna have different glue code, different uh, utility libraries. That's okay, that's fine. Your application just needs a place where you can do this. This also means for local developments, use some system like .env, where you provide basically fake environment variables in a, a .env file. Most languages have libraries like this. Most languages I've uh, seen actually have multiple libraries because of course. Um, don't check this file into Git. This file should never be deployed to production. In production, you read real environment variables. This is just for local use. This also means trust, uh, trusted domains. If your application has some kind of trusted domain that only accepts requests for certain domains, that's gonna vary depending on your production versus staging versus development uh, configuration. So let it. Never put the domain name in the database. It also means do not use constants for configuration. They are a pain in the butt. They make everything harder. They make testing harder. They make overriding them harder. It just makes the glue code more difficult. So don't do that. Let dependency inject your environment through environment variables. This will make your life a lot easier. Related to that, though, is a, you also have to worry about user-configured connections, by which I mean installers. Who has systems that have an ins installation process of some kind? A Couple of people, all right. Your basic installer looks like this. First thing it does is ask for database credentials. 
Then it asks the user for some basic site information, writes those configuration credentials out to a log file, set up the database, create tables, whatever it's gonna do, uh, writes that basic site info to the database or config file or, or whatever it is, and it's done. And that's great, and that's wonderful, and that completely fails in a cloud environment where you have a, a read-only file system because it can't do that whole write to disk thing, and you don't know the database credentials because they're provided in environment variables, which we just discussed as a good thing, so don't do that. Instead, better approach is include the connection glue. Include all of that glue code we just talked about out of the box in the install process. And your installer should be set up to just skip uh, values that it already has from the environment. It's like you already have database credentials, great, don't ask the user for them. It, therefore, it doesn't need to write out the config file. <clears throat> the installer should not try downloading additional code during the install process. It can download data, like translations or something, but it should not download code. And finally, this is somewhat against my own self-interest, but I'm gonna say it anyway, because people need to hear it. Avoid vendor lock-in. Whatever host you're working with, whatever cloud provider you're working with, whether it's platform or someone else, don't tie your system to that. Always be able to take your business elsewhere. The fact that you can take your business elsewhere is what keeps those providers honest. Even the ones you like, even the ones you think are going to be good to you, that are never going to uh, you know, screw you over, they're paying attention to their best interests, not yours. You need to pay attention to your best interest. Be able to take your business elsewhere. That provides competitive pressure on them to stay honest. How do you do that? Use free software. Don't use proprietary systems. Use things that you can easily replace. If you use some proprietary system, some proprietary uh, API from a single provider and your system is based on that, and they go out of business, and they change their pricing model, they change their terms of service, sucks to be you. If your application does not actually work without AWS Lambda, you are 100% beholden to Amazon and they can destroy your business by tweaking one setting. And that should scare you. Bear in mind, this is a incomplete list of the number of products Google has killed. Uh, this is just up through 2015. There's not even counting the stuff they've killed since then. Well, I, I added Google Plus. If your application, if your business is based on one of these things, then when Google pulled the plug, they pulled the plug on you. Don't let this happen to you. You need to keep your best interest in mind because this provider does not. Platform SH has our best interest in mind. Obviously, we're a business. We want to, to work with you, but you need to be able to take your business elsewhere because that puts pressure on us to stay honest. How do you do that? Stick to open source tools. MySQL, Postgres, RabbitMQ, Solar, you know, whatever else. You know, pick something. If you could install it yourself, it's okay. Not because you're going to install it yourself, but because you could pay someone else to install it for you rather than the, com the company you're currently with. What's not safe? Any of these services that are uh, specific to one provider. <clears throat> if you can't say, oh, this one provider is now changing their rules, they've gone out of business, they've um, changed their pricing model, they've decided to start centering content, whatever, and you can't say, okay, never mind, move over here, then that's a risk factor. That is a major risk factor. To be clear here, I'm not against using services. I'm not opposed to using hosted services, obviously, I'm not opposed to using API services, but you need to maintain portability. You need to be able to, av to avoid vendor lock-in, avoid those dependencies. This is not really a cloud computing problem. This is a general outsourcing problem. So this is more of a the cloud type problem, but it's one you need to be mindful of. Design your system so that you can change vendors if you need to. So in summary then, <clears throat> don't assume things. Don't assume the number of environments you have. Don't assume the type of environment your code is running in. Don't assume the number of web heads your application is going to be running on. Don't assume what your database connection information is or any other connection information. Don't assume your API keys. Don't assume the database, your, your, actually the domain name where your site will be running. Don't assume you have write access. 
to the disk, because you probably don't. You probably don't want it, in fact. And don't assume that the third party that you're leveraging is going to exist forever, because the number of services that have gone out of business is much larger than the number have, that have succeeded. And you don't want to be part of the splash damage when that happens. Thank you.